Well, how's everyone doing? Surviving? Here we are, the first afternoon. We're coming up for 24 hours into Keswick, and you're still awake and you're here. I'm impressed. <laughs> Look, it's, it's just been uh, such a privilege to be here, and I really mean that. Uh, who heard Rod Walsh's talk this afternoon at 1 o'clock? Wasn't that fantastic? Now, unfortunately, Rod has stolen all my material for the rest of the weekend. <coughs> well, sort of, but anyway. <laughs> I was talking with him afterwards and he said, you know, but people need repetition. So I think maybe that might be the key. <laughs> well, I want to talk this afternoon on this subject, the foundation of the Christian faith. And uh, not surprisingly, I believe that we find that foundation in the book of Genesis, uh, as I was sharing this morning. But you know, if you don't get the foundations right, then terrible things happen. And I'm uh, very impressed with this picture. The bit that I really love is the front steps. See the front steps still there? Wouldn't that be awesome, walking up the steps to your door to discover that your house has moved? But something obviously is wrong, isn't there? When that was constructed, they didn't spend enough time thinking about the foundations and making sure they were solidly grounded. Psalm 11.3 says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And those foundations are laid at a very early age. That's why I'm so impressed with what the Child Evangelism Fellowship guys are doing. Aren't they awesome? I think it's fantastic work. You know, when young people, children, commit their lives to the Lord, that sets them on a path for the rest of their lives and it makes such a profound difference. As I shared last night, I was just 11 when I committed my life to the Lord. And it really does make a difference. But then, of course, we need to disciple and train and teach. And so much of what our ministry is about is doing just that. And it's providing answers. I shared some testimonies in this morning's session. I want to share another one which actually is very sad. It's a very famous man, Dan Brown. He wrote the um, uh, Da Vinci Code books and several other books, very exciting books, very uh, action-packed. Uh, but he shared this testimony in an interview. He said, I was raised Episcopalian, in the US that is, and I was very religious as a kid. Then in eighth or ninth grade, I studied astronomy, cosmology, and the origins of the universe. I remember saying to a minister, I don't get it. I read a book that said there was an explosion known as the Big Bang, but here it says God created heaven and the earth in seven days, which is right. Unfortunately, the response I got was, nice boys, don't ask that question. What a tragic response. A light went off and I said, the Bible doesn't make sense. Science makes much more sense to me. And I just gravitated away from religion. What a shame. Now think if that minister had at his fingertips the resources that we now have available to answer those kinds of questions. What a difference that man's life could have been. You know, Richard Dawkins, we've talked a little bit about Richard, in the course of this week, week you'll, uh, weekend, rather, you'll hear some more quotes from him too before I'm, I'm through because he comes out with some absolute gems which I just can't resist. But anyway, he was asked a question on a TV program and uh, the question was, was there a particular point or something that you read or an experience that you had that said, yes, this is it, God doesn't exist? And this is how Richard Dawkins replied. Oh, well, by far the most important, I suppose, was understanding evolution. I think there really is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity. And I think I realised that at the age of about 16. 16. Another teenager. Whatever vestige of Christian faith he may have had at that stage, he jettisoned because of evolution. But he says an interesting thing. There is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity. Now, I shared before that I grew up, and for many years, in fact, all the way through until the end of my postgraduate work at university, I just assumed that God used evolution to create. And I shared this morning some of the, the struggle that I had and the confusion that I had because I was rejecting part of what God specifically says in his word. 
But of course, the deep incompatibility is this, and I've shared this illustration before, and I'll probably share it again, because I think it graphically displays the problem. Evolution places death and suffering before man for millions of years. But the Bible says that it was man's actions in the garden that led to death and suffering coming into the world. And that, of course, is confirmed in the New Testament where Paul says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and that one man, of course, was Adam, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. So that's the deep incompatibility. It's fascinating how so often it's the atheists who see the problem. And many people in the church don't see it. They think that somehow or other the evolutionary story is a given, it's a proven fact, and we just have to integrate it somehow into our understanding of the scriptures. I want to draw an analogy in this talk. Two trees. Now, the roots of the tree go down into our beliefs. And the fruit of the tree will reflect where our roots go. Now, the first tree has its roots down into the assumption or the belief that there is no God. The other tree, that there is a God. Now, if there is no God, that means that man alone decides what is true. I mean, we're it, right? We all got here by chance, apparently. We alone decide truth. And uh, I read somewhere just recently that people are saying we are now living in a post-truth society. How awesome is that? Do you realise that? You're living in a... Now, what does post-truth mean? That means we're all living lies. <laughs> How bizarre is the world in which we live? But if there is a God, then God's word is truth. And the theme for this weekend is God's word, the truth, and our, our authority in all things. Now, if man decides truth, then when he explains the universe, he attempts to do it in natural terms. He has to, because there's no God, remember, in this assumption. And so evolution is the name given to that construct, that set of ideas that tries to explain the universe. But if God's word is truth, we read that God created the heavens and the earth. Now, friends, I'm not trying to create a false dichotomy here because I know, and I was one, there are many Christians who believe that God used evolution. But I hope, as a result of this morning's session, you will have grasped something of the conflict that that produces, the impossibility, in fact, of that being true. But nonetheless, you end up with a very confused situation. A heart that is born again, committed to the Lord, but a mind that's all over the place that doesn't fit with what God has clearly spelled out in his word. And that was me for many, many years. So, from God's revelation, his word, we get what we could call a biblical worldview. And I've summarised it here like this. Right at the beginning, there was a perfect creation. Then man rebelled, and that brought the curse into the earth. Then God brought the catastrophe of Noah's flood, and Rod so magnificently explained that earlier this afternoon. Following the flood came the Tower of Babel and the confusion of languages and the people spread out over the face of the earth. And at just the right time in all of history, Jesus came, God in human form. And then he, of course, gave his life for us on the cross. He rose from the dead. The Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. The church was born. And finally, the Bible says there will be a consummation of all things, the new heavens and the new earth. But the whole of that biblical worldview is predicated on the assumption, in the beginning, God. There is a causal agent behind the whole of this physical space-time universe in which we live. Now, we could ask a question, what is man? Now, according to the biblical worldview, we get several answers. Man, firstly, has been made in the image of God. We learn that man is loved by God, so much so that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we learn that we were created for relationship, of course, with our Heavenly Father, but also with each other. But from man's reasoning, we get the evolutionary worldview. 
Now it's very different. It begins with uh, some cosmic explosion called the Big Bang 14 billion years or so ago. From that came galaxies and stars and planetary systems and geological evolution took place and our Earth evolved and mountains and so on formed and then somehow or other um, chemicals uh, ar arrange themselves in that first living cell and that's called chemical evolution and then random processes acted on by natural selection caused all the extraordinary diversity of living things that we see in the world today through biological evolution and then finally as a subset of biological evolution we have the evolution of human beings and here we all are so the story goes but it's all predicated upon the assumption of in the beginning nothing so out of nothing has come everything there is no causal agent for the universe in the evolutionary story so what answers do we get if we ask the question what is man well here are some attempts Bertrand Russell we're a curious accident in a backwater Peter Atkins an Oxford professor we're just a bit of slime on the planet how are you feeling Stephen J. Gould, a fortuitous cosmic afterthought, a tiny little twig on the enormously arborescent bush of life. Now I'll give him 10 out of 10 for English. <laughs> are you feeling encouraged this afternoon? <laughs> what a sad and sorry picture. Richard Dawkins, we live in a universe which has no design, no purpose, no evil and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. You wonder why these people get out of bed in the morning, don't you? <laughs> and this one I like, Susan Blackmore. Well, like in inverted commas, right? In the end, nothing matters. If you th really think about evolution and why we human beings are here, you have to come to the conclusion that we are here for absolutely no reason at all. Your science class went for ages. You seem a bit down. What happened? Oh, the teacher said we're nothing special. We came from pond scum. We're just evolved apes. What are they teaching in your next class? Self-esteem. <laughs> Can you see the problem? <laughs> it is funny, but it's not funny because most of our society believes the evolutionary story. And where do you end up if you follow the logic through? Well, here's William Provine, a very outspoken atheistic professor, and he said this, let me summarise my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposive forces of any kind. There is no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain that I'm going to be completely dead. That's going to be the end of me. There's no ultimate foundation for ethics and no ultimate meaning in life and no free will for humans either. Now, if you think about the last phrase, presumably he had, he had no choice in writing that. But anyway, that's a bit, a bit deep. <laughs> so... The fruit that comes from the tree with its roots down into atheism is no purpose in life. You see, folks, if you got here accidentally over millions of years, what's the point? I mean, if life is tough, why don't you check out? Who cares? What's the difference? There's no purpose, is there? But if we are the result of a purposeful, powerful, loving creator God, then every single one of us has been made lovingly by him for his purposes. So there is a purpose to our lives, praise God. So then we ask another question, when does life then begin? Well, the Bible tells us, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So the Bible tells us very clearly that life begins at conception. You know, science has also figured this out. Here's a quote from a new scientist that says, DNA technologies indisputably prove that the unborn child is a whole human being from the moment of fertilisation, that all abortions terminate the life of a human being, and that the unborn child is a separate human patient under the care of modern medicine. You know, it's, it's obvious, isn't it? 
And we've all seen images like this one, a little child around 24 weeks in utero. I happen to be the proud grandfather of nine grandchildren, the youngest of which is nine weeks old. Um, and they're all beautiful, of course. <laughs> but you know, years ago, a man called Ernst Heichel produced a set of drawings which purported to show that we all sort of started off the same, that in utero we go through a fish stage and so on, and we're all just, somehow or other it reflects our evolutionary ancestry. But then a scientist decided to actually photograph each of these embryos. Now, Heichel lived in the late 1800s, and it was shown to be fraud back then, and yet it perpetuated in textbooks for many years. So Richardson and co. took some actual photographs of those embryos at the same stages. And in the article, Richardson said, this is one of the worst cases of scientific fraud. It's shocking to find that somebody, one thought was a great scientist, and was deliberately misleading. It makes me angry. What Heichel did was to take a human embryo and copy it pretending that the salamander and the pig looked the same at the same stage of development. They don't. These are fakes. And yet this drawing has been the basis of so many justifications for aborting a pre-born child. I want to show a little chart here. Each of the tombstones there represents 10,000 people dead. In World War I, just short of 60,000 Australians died in action. In World War II, it was 21,000. The Korean War, 278. The Vietnam War, a bit hard to see those, isn't it? But the war on the unborn child in Australia to 2016 is about 3 million. Friends, we live in a desperately needy and sick society. So when does life end? Evolution has played a major role in paving the way for the acceptance of euthanasia. Evolution reduces humans to the level of animals, making it just as acceptable to put down a human as to put down a dog. If God has given life, man has no right to take it away. And the Bible says, the psalmist says, But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. So friends, the fruit of the tree that goes down into atheism is that life is ultimately expendable because we're just here by accident. But the fruit of the tree that goes down into biblical Christianity is that life is sacred. We are made in God's image. So let's look at mankind. The evolutionary story says that we have a common ancestor with the great apes that goes back some several million years, various different groups of them. And uh, one of the evolutionists, Stephen Jay Gould, in fact admitted that biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. So what he means is that whilst people may have had racist tendencies, Evolutionary theory in the 1800s, mid-1800s, gave a scientific excuse for expressing that racism. And Australia has had a very dark past in this regard. Aboriginal people were slain because of this theory about how whites were further up the evolutionary tree. And in fact, this guy, Cora H. Wills, who uh, later became the mayor of Bowen, confessed to killing an Aborigine who was later used for science. You see, the idea was that we should be able to put these, these bodies on display in museums showing the progression of evolution all the way from microbes up to superior human beings. And right at the top of the pile, of course, were the Caucasians. And uh, you're probably aware that there's been a move afoot for quite a number of years now to try and repatriate Aboriginal remains. You see, the press covers this and they talk about how there's a lot of negotiation going, trying to bring remains back, but they're in European universities and, and, and museums, but nobody says why they are there. You know why they're there? Efforts to retrieve the remains began 25 years ago. They'd been displayed in the anthropological wing of the Musée de l'Homme 
the Museum of Mankind in Paris. The most vocal opponents to repatriation tend to be the anthropologists in the museums. A lot of these people look at Aborigines as biologically inferior. In fact, this idea of their inferiority spread to the extent of believing that Aboriginal people could not receive the gospel. Charles Kingsley said this, the black people of Australia, exactly the same race as the African Negro, cannot take in the gospel. All attempts to bring them to a knowledge of the true God have as yet utterly failed. Poor brutes in human shape. They must perish off the face of the earth like brute beasts. How horrendous is that? Now this of course is terribly politically incorrect today. But friends, the whole concept, the evolutionary teaching that we inject into our society has just underneath the surface this shallow inference. In fact, um, I wasn't going to share this, but I think I will just, uh, just for interest's sake. Um, every now and again, something like this occurs at a sporting event. Um, all over the world, black footballers are subject to monkey chants and or having bananas waved or thrown onto the playing field. This never happens to white players and even if it did, it would not be seen as offensive or racist. But just last year, here's Eddie Betts, an AFL player, and uh, this was reported in, uh, in the advertiser. I don't think anyone should doubt that it was a racist act, McLaughlin said firmly. A banana being thrown at an indigenous man is unambiguously racist. Well, why? Why? What's the basis for the racist symbolism of hurling bananas at black football players? The person who did this, by the way, had no idea. Got in all kinds of trouble. But of course, the basis is belief in evolution. That's where it comes from. Of course, Aboriginal people white people, Asian people, all people groups, are all part of our human family, as I'll share in just a few moments. Now these two guys, George, Snow, Wilson, I'm not sure why they called him Snow, but anyway, <laughs> must have been a reason, and Bill on the right, Aboriginal guy, were great friends. In fact, they uh, fought together in the Vietnam War. George became a kidney donor for Bill who needed a kidney transplant. They searched throughout his family. No one had the right match, but George did. You see, under the skin, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And in fact, with the skin as well, <laughs> because we have all descended from our first parents, Adam and Eve. So what does the Bible say about the origin of the different people groups? Well, there's a fascinating story in Genesis chapter 11, just nine verses given to it. Now this has occurred immediately after the flood and God has instructed Noah and his descendants to spread out over the face of the earth and to populate the world. Now you might think that after such a cataclysmic judgment as the flood, we might just be obedient. I say we because we've all got that same Adamic nature, haven't we? So what did we do? Well, we gathered together in one place, the Bible says, on a plain called Shinar. There we built a great city that was going to have a huge tower that would reach to the heavens because we wanted to make a name for ourselves. So what happened? God came down and confused the languages of the people. Now, let me ask a question. Does anybody here speak a language other than English? Just give me a wave. Yep, yep, lots of you, lots of you. So if you hear someone speaking and you can't understand them, it's no big deal, is it? You'd think, ah, oh, they're just talking another language. But try and think what it would have been like. You see, at this point in Earth history, there was only one language ever spoken. Adam and Eve would have had a language, which they taught to their children, which they taught to their children, which they taught to their children. This could go on. <laughs> so if anybody ever spoke to you, you would understand them entirely. Let's think about it. You wake up in the morning, you have breakfast, you head off to work, perhaps you're working on the tower that day, and you turn up and everybody's babbling at you. I mean, you might work in a place like that, I'm not sure. But, <laughs> but you would quickly realise that people that you communicated with yesterday, you now could not. You would quickly realise that something profound had happened. There would be great confusion and fear. I can imagine even violence might have broken out. And then in the midst of it all, you hear someone speaking, and you can understand them. You'd go straight to that person, wouldn't you, and say, what is going on? I can imagine how small, 
population groups with a common language would form quickly and they would just get out of the place. They would flee. Now, something interesting happens when a small population group starts to reproduce. You see, previously recessive genes, which could not so easily express their characteristics in a larger population, could then do so. And as these groups moved, some to high latitude countries that were cold and so on, and others to low latitude countries, hot equatorial regions, small changes could be locked in by natural selection. Now I'm going to talk about natural selection tonight, and but it's not the same as evolution, and I'll explain why later on. But I'm talking here of physical features, things like nose shape or eye shape, for instance, hair colour and texture. And what about this question of skin colour? How many different skin colours do you think there might be today? Well, let me ask you some questions. Who thinks there would be more than 100 different skin colours in the world today? More than 100? Yeah, a few of you. OK, that means everybody else must think it's less. So who thinks it would be between, say, 10 and 100 different skin colours in the world today? OK, who never puts their hand up if asked a question? <laughs> I think there's a few people sitting on the fence here. <laughs> Do you know what it's fascinating? There is actually only one skin colour. You see, our skin is determined by a reddish-brown pigment called melanin. And if your genes are coded to manufacture lots and lots of melanin, you'll have dark skin, dark hair, dark eyes. Um, if you're like me and you're something of a degenerate mutant, then uh, <laughs> don't laugh, because a lot of you are, <laughs> then you'll have very fair skin. Now, I'm called white, but I'm not white. If you put a white sheet of paper next to my hand, it's not the same colour. If it was, I'd be in big trouble. <laughs> I'm actually a very light brown colour. So we're just a variation from very light to very dark of all these different shades. Now, people sometimes ask us, what would Adam and Eve's skin colour have been? Now, I can remember growing up and seeing picture books with Adam and Eve as blonde-haired, blue-eyed Caucasians. There's no way in the world that could be, because from Adam and Eve's genes, have come the manufacturing instructions, if I can use that word, for every single human being that has ever lived or that will ever live, with all the skin colours from so-called white to so-called black. So it's most likely that Adam and Eve would have had mid-brown skin. And, uh, well, you've already seen this, but here's a couple, mid-brown, as you can tell. They each had a black father and a white mother, so-called. And they had twin girls. But in their genes was all the information for making the whole range of skin colours. And here are their twin daughters. How cute are they? <laughs> Almost as cute as my granddaughters. <laughs> now, we had an article in our creation magazine about them. We called them the two-tone twins. It was so popular, we made it into a little leaflet. And we've got some of those up at the tables at the back. Those leaflets, by the way, are free. Please make sure that you take uh, some. Now, we caught up with them a little bit later on, interestingly, still on the same stool. But what had happened at the Tower of Babel was that a common gene pool was divided up along uh, language barriers, and that is what has given rise to all of the different ethnic and people groups around the world today. But, you know, we are all part of the one human family. Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters, we read in the Bible, all the way down to Noah and his family who survived the flood. And then after them, we have the Tower of Babel and all the different cultural groups have arisen. So one of the fruits of the atheistic tree is racism. Now, I'm not saying that people who believe in evolution are racists. Don't un misunderstand me. But it gives an excuse for it. And history shows how tragic that excuse has been. But if we believe the Bible, then we understand that we are part of one human family. The Bible says that there is a basis for marriage. Jesus was challenged about marriage. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made the male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And the Bible says the marriage, marriage should be honoured by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. You see, God gives us directions, laws for our benefit. 
And he says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Friends, we are in a society in upheaval right now, and I don't have to tell you that. There's a postal survey going on about this whole question of same-sex marriage. But there are so many untruths that are out there, and people are confused. And I want to perhaps just touch quickly on this. I want to share with, with you what I would call some fixed stars in this whole same-sex marriage debate. And the first of them is this, just from a purely scientific point of view. At the moment of conception, you either have or you do not have a Y chromosome. If you have a Y chromosome, you're a male. If you do not, you're a female. Through the whole cell division process, through to birth, the process is preserved, you're a male or a female. There is a very tiny percentage, like a tenth of a percent, of people who might end up with three X's, perhaps. And there are some other rare combinations. Many of them, though, are very, very serious. In fact, all of them are serious. But the vast majority, it's crystal clear, scientifically, you're male or you're female. And to hear the phrase, we were born that way, is not true. But what happens is life circumstances can lead to gender dysphoria. All kinds of tragic things. There could be an absent parent. There could be a dysfunctional family, an abusive parent, perhaps. All sorts of situations lead to confusion, usually with young people in their teens as their sexuality is developing. In almost every case, that is resolved in due course in accordance with the reality of their body, which is biologically unambiguous. So I think what people need who suffer from same-sex attraction is help. If you are trying to live a life that is inconsistent with reality, you are not going to have good prospects for your development intellectually, emotionally, psychologically, physically, in every area of human flourishing, you'll be disadvantaged. But if you live in accordance with your reality of how God made you at the moment of conception, you have so much better a chance at flourishing as God has called you. Sadly, though, the church, I believe, has largely failed to reach out to the homosexual community. You see, we're all sinners in need of salvation. And, and I've heard of churches who have turned homosexual people away. Now, Paul deals very clearly with the, this partiality. He says, if a rich man comes into your congregation, do you bring him down to the front and give him a seat of honour? And the poor man, do you make him stand up the back? You see, friends, we can't clean our fish until we have caught them. We can't expect unregenerate people to live a Christian life until they're born again. So everybody needs that encounter with Jesus. The church should be bringing in all people and introducing them to Jesus. Actually, the church should be going out and introducing them to Jesus. A pastor once said to me, you know, I look out over my congregation and there they all are. Fornicators, adulterers, murderers, thieves, homosexuals, people disobedient to their parents. The lot, all praising God. It's beautiful. You see, we are all sinners in need of a saviour. And it's a tragedy when churches, sadly, judge people. And that is part of the issue that we face. Right now, the legislation on same-sex marriage, if it occurs, and I pray that it will not, it will open the doors to fundamental changes in society. I believe we'll see loss of freedom of speech and freedom of religion, which we can test by looking at what's happened in Canada and the UK and in New Zealand already. It will not just be acceptance of, but celebration of homosexuality. And our children will be taught radical gender theory even at school. There's a great little leaflet that is available in the corridor out the back at the family voice stand. I recommend you get hold of one of those. And can I just say, if you have not yet voted, please do so. It's important that you do. Do you know that you can change your vote? All you have to do is contact the ABS. They'll send you new papers, but you don't have long to do it. 
In fact, in the next, I think this week was about the last uh, available opportunity. So we can picture the problem like this. There are two castles. The one on the left has its foundations in evolution, where man decides truth. And out of that castle comes all the issues that we see happening in our society today. Over on the right, we have the Christian castle and its foundation should be creation, God's word is truth. But unfortunately, some Christians are busy trying to destroy their own foundations. There's a lot of them. There's a whole bunch who are busy dealing with these social issues as well they should, and that's to be applauded. Some Christians are lining up to take pot shots at other Christians. This guy's just shooting randomly off into space. And this bloke's got no idea there's even a war going on. So what, friends, is the solution? Well, I believe the first thing we need to do is rebuild the church's foundations by starting with God's word as the truth and the creation account as Genesis as being uh, our foundation for the gospel. We need to attack the foundations of the humanistic castle. We need to continue to deal with the social issues and we should be seeking to break down humanism in our culture. So we can sum it up like this. The tree with roots in atheism produces moral relativism. But the tree with roots in biblical Christianity recognises that there are moral absolutes. So what's happened over the years is that the scientist has presented this evidence, the rocks and the fossils and the layers, to the church. And the theologian has sadly said, oh, you mean it's a fact? Well, I'll just have to add them to the Bible. And friends, that has been a tragic compromise. There are all sorts of different ways people have attempted to put millions of years into the Bible. But they're not there, and I'm going to share on some of these tomorrow afternoon. But every single one of them fails because they all place death before Adam. And what's the problem with that? That means there's no point in Jesus going to the cross. So the entire gospel collapses. But what do we do with the edifice of evidence that supports the evolutionary story? I want to touch on just one aspect of that now and then tonight I'm going to do some more, tomorrow morning even more, tomorrow night. Again, we're looking at geology, biology and astronomy. Um, but let's just look at um, one other aspect. So we actually have tons of evidence and I like Mike Adams' statement, if Christianity dies in America, and I think you could say the West, it will not be for a lack of evidence of its truthfulness, it will be for a lack of the dissemination of the evidence of its truthfulness. So the first thing we need to lay a hold of is that science is actually limited. Now, as you know, I spent a lot of time working in the communications satellite industry. So the kind of science I worked in was what you call operational science. It's based on observable, repeatable experiments. So you can conduct an experiment in one part of the world and some other part of the world and other scientists could replicate that experiment to, um, and perhaps extend that area of research. But the important thing is it's based on observable, repeatable experiments. But there's another kind of science. We could call it historical science. Now, historical science is when a scientist looks at evidence in the present and he tries to work out what happened in the past to lead to what he's observing in the present. But there's a difference. You see, it's still science, but it has another added component. And that component is that the scientist makes up a story about the past to explain what he's observing. Now, when you make up a story about the past, and if you think about it, this is inevitable, you engage your beliefs about the past. So this guy looks at this uh, fossil in the rock, and if he believes the evolutionary story, he may well think to himself, you know, this little fossil, um, I, you know, well, well, I wonder first where it fits in that long, slow progression from that first primordial cell all the way up to complex organisms like you and me. And, and he might ask, how many millions of years ago did it live? So can you see that what he believes influences how he interprets the evidence? Does that make sense? But if this guy believes the, um, the biblical account, say, he might look at that fossil and say to himself, you know, this little fossil was likely laid down as a result of Noah's flood which would have deposited pretty much the whole of the fossil record all around the world today. 
Now, friends, that is a radically different interpretation of exactly the same evidence. So we don't actually argue about the evidence because we've all got the same fossils, rocks, trees, stars, living systems and so on. But our interpretation of the evidence depends upon what we already believe. So we don't approach the evidence with neutrality. We approach it with a pre-existing bias. And so the question is, which bias is the best bias with which to be biased? And I would argue that basing what we believe on the word of God is the way to go. So operational science, it's based on the present, observable and repeatable processes. Historical science is based on the unobservable, unrepeatable past. So it's a little bit like a courtroom scene, you know, the, uh, the prosecution looks at the evidence and he interprets the evidence as meaning that the accused is guilty of the crime. And then the defence lawyer stands up and he interprets exactly the same evidence as meaning that the accused is innocent. Same evidence, different interpretations. So how do we find out the truth? Well, just like the scene of the crime, we need an eyewitness. If there was somebody there in the past who firstly, obviously was there, who loves us, who would not deceive us, who has written down everything we need to know about our origins, then we would have a basis for knowing about our origins. And friends, we have this in the Bible. It's like a history book of the universe. And that history book gives us a very clear timeline all the way from Adam through to Noah, to Abraham, from Abraham through to King David, and then by the line of Mary and the line of Joseph all the way to the time of Jesus. Now, on that chart is roughly 4,000 years of elapsed history. Between the time of Jesus and today is about 2,000 years. So that says that according to the Bible, now this is not my idea, right? The Bible teaches that here we stand today about 6,000 years after the creation. Wow, what do you do with that? I mean, how can you believe that today? Surely the evidence in support of the millions and millions of years is overwhelming. Well, I want to share just a few examples quickly. I'm running out of time, so let me try and gallop along a bit. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm going too fast. You can always talk to me uh, afterwards. The moon is actually receding from us. And we know that because the Apollo missions left some corner reflectors on the surface of the moon by shining radar, uh, laser beams, sorry, at the, uh, at the moon on these corner reflectors and measuring the signals back. We can determine that it's drifting out at about 3.8 centimetres every year. Now, that doesn't seem like very much, but it corresponds to a slowing down in the Earth's rotation rate. But the closest that the moon could ever have been to the Earth is what's called the Roche limit, and it's pretty close into the Earth. So if you give the best possible case, so the Moon is as close as possible and then it's moved out to where it is now, the rate, by the way, is non-linear, you put a maximum age on the Moon of about 1.3 billion years. But friends, that's only about a third of the claimed age of the solar system. So what we can measure with regards to the Moon tells us that the 4.5 billion year claimed age cannot be right. But then we find other things. There's a a, uh, an asteroid orbiting beyond Saturn and it was found to have rings. Another one incidentally was found in the last couple of weeks or announced. And uh, the problem is such small rings around a small asteroid only 250 kilometres in diameter would very quickly disappear. How come they're still there four and a half billion years later? And the lead scientist said something is missing in our understanding. He's right because he starts with the assumption there's no God. So no wonder he gets confusing results. His predicts are never, it seems, borne out. The continents around the world today, the river systems are eroding the continents at the rate of about 20 billion tonnes every year. It's being dumped into the ocean basins. But the continents would erode down to sea level in less than 25 million years at current rates. But hang on a minute, that doesn't make sense. The Earth is supposed to be four and a half billion years old. So there's a massive disconnect. The Earth has a magnetic field which is losing energy very rapidly. It's believed to be formed by a circulating current near the Earth's core mantle boundary. 
and, uh, but it's losing half of its energy every 1600 years. So if you go back to the time of Jesus, then the magnetic field would have been about two and a half times stronger than it is today. If you go back to the time of the flood four and a half thousand years ago, it would have been about seven times stronger than it is today. But the problem is the stronger the field, the stronger that current, which means the more heat it will dissipate. And so ultimately you get to a point where the earth would be so hot it couldn't sustain life. And that places an upper limit on the age of the earth of only about 20,000 years. Our atmosphere has a certain amount of helium in it. It's constantly being added through radioactive decay processes in the Earth's crust. Now, helium is that gas in party balloons. You know, all your kids will have done this. You get a mouthful of it, it makes your voice sound funny. Some of it actually escapes into the outer atmosphere, but there's a net rate at which it is accumulating. So knowing how much is there, which we can measure, knowing how rapidly it's accumulating, which we can also measure, we can place an upper limit on the age of the Earth's atmosphere of only two million years. That's a disaster for the evolutionary story because if the atmosphere is only two million years, there's been nowhere near enough time for life to have evolved. Now let's just look around us. There's about seven or seven and a half billion people on the planet today. Do you know if you start with Shem, Ham and Japheth, Noah's sons and their wives, six people, let that population rate grow at just under half a percent for four and a half thousand years. You know what you get? About seven billion. Now half a percent is actually a conservative growth rate. It's somewhat more than that now. So it more than adequately accounts for wars, famines and diseases. But the point is the population of the earth today is consistent with the age of the earth according to the Bible totally inconsistent with the evolutionary story. Friends, there's an excellent article on our website. Um, you can find it at uh, creation.com forward slash age and it lists 101 ways that uh, we can place an upper limit on the age of the atmosphere that is totally inconsistent with the evolutionary story. Now the Bible says, as I shared this morning, that uh, we are to demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And I mentioned this morning the Creation magazine and I just want to tell you a bit more about it because this is a vital resource. It's written for lay people. You don't have to be a scientist to understand it and we get so many testimonies from people whose lives have been impacted by Creation magazine. This lady wrote and said, thank you for this much needed magazine. The information empowers Christians to share the gospel. That's fantastic, isn't it? Because you're confident in being able to deal with the questions you might be asked. I love this one. I was converted when someone gave me a creation magazine. How awesome is that? All someone did was give him one and he came to the Lord. But I like what he did next. Then I subscribed for five of my relatives. Four of them have now come to the Lord. How awesome is that now? I can't help but do the mathematics and that says he has an 80% success rate on his evangelism efforts. Who here would like an 80% success rate? <laughs> this is a marvellous tool for doing just that. It comes out four times a year. You can subscribe for one or three years. Along with the print subscription, you will also get a digital subscription if you provide us with an email address. Now, the beauty of the digital subscription is it can be accessed on up to five different devices. So if you've got a computer at home, a laptop, a smartphone, and one of these I thingies that people download stuff on, then this is a great way, parents, to give access to your children to a Creation Magazine subscription or grandparents to your grandchildren. Now, if you subscribe today for one year, we'll give you this DVD called Fallout for free. It goes for about 20 minutes and it interviews university students who all used to go to church. Some now do, some now don't. All of those that do have been exposed to the sort of material you're hearing at Keswick Convention. Scientific arguments in support of the biblical account of creation. All those that have walked away from their faith, of those, none of them had heard any such material. Very powerful, forgiving to perhaps pastors who do not yet understand the importance of this issue. Now if you subscribe for three years, we'll give you not only the Fallout DVD, but your choice of how Darwin got it wrong or creation evangelism, how to use this material in sharing your faith. 
So just go up to the back there and, uh, and our uh, friends up there will help you and make sure that you get your free gift. So let me sum it up quickly this way. The Bible depicts three conditions for the earth. Firstly, an original perfect world into which has come an intrusion of death, disease and suffering. That's the world that we live in. There is also coming a future world, a new heavens and a new earth. Now friends, if we allow the millions of years into our thinking, it's like taking that top corner out of the picture. But can you see what that now means? It means that God created the world in its fallen state, full of suffering and death. But it's even worse than that because the new heavens and the new earth are going to be a restoration a restoration to what? More suffering and death? You see, there is actually no hope for the future if the millions of years are true. That, folks, is why we must put that top left-hand corner back into our understanding. And that then becomes the basis of how we present our gospel to this lost and dying world. So thank you very much for your attention. Now, this, this evening, I'm going to be talking a little more about biology and uh, we'll deal with such things as natural selection and some, some genetics which uh, show how the biblical record of history is true. Tomorrow morning we're going to talk more about geology. In the afternoon we've got uh, how to answer people's questions. And then tomorrow night one of my favourite subjects which is astronomy and how the stars declare the glory of God. Thank you for hanging in there with me. I'm looking forward to the rest of the convention and all that we can do together. Let me ask the musicians now to come back up. Thank you very much.